What is up you guys welcome back to my channel and if you are new here welcome to my channel and welcome to a true welcome to another true crime sunday now today's case that we're going to be talking about is literally a case that i learned about yesterday and i was learning about it when i was getting my hair done the hairdresser found out that i did true crime and she was like have you heard of this case and i was like i literally have never heard of it in my life but it is one of the biggest cases in Australia and it is a missing baby case. It's a missing persons case and it is still pretty much unsolved. Today we're going to be talking about the disappearance of Tegan Lane. More specifically we're going to be talking about Kelly Lane. Now my research for this case has mostly been from online searches but I did get a huge chunk of it by watching a three-part documentary by the ABC network. It's called Exposed and if you want to watch that it has a lot of detail, obviously, because it goes for three parts. But I did get a huge chunk of it from this documentary here, and they did a brilliant job. There are some things that I do disagree with, and we'll talk about that later in the video. But this is where I got a huge chunk of my information. So this is a huge reference here. So Kelly Lane was born on the 21st of March in 1975 to Sandra and Robert Lane. Her father is a retired police officer from the Manly Police Force, and her mother was a nurse for the Manly Hospital. Kelly went to McKellar High, which is an all-girls school in Manly. At the time, the area was described as being super close-knit and really gossipy, and everyone learned how to keep their secrets really well, especially the popular girls, which Kelly was one of the popular girls. She was known as being this sporty, fun, and they, there was this natural sexual energy about her, apparently. Her parents were super well known in the community and were extremely strict on Kelly. In the documentary, which was kind of funny at this point when her friends were asked, are you fearful? If they're so strict, are you fearful of Kelly's parents? And one of the friends straight up without hesitation said, I'm scared of her mother. One person said that Mrs. Lane was incredibly tough and that you need to tread lightly with her. And we definitely saw that throughout the interviews in this documentary. Like this lady is, she seems quite narcissistic. A subsequent result of two pregnancies at 17 years old and 18 years old led to two abortions for Kelly. The first abortion was in 1992 to her long-term boyfriend, Aaron, who claims that Kelly was his first love. One day, Kelly brought Aaron to her bedroom and said that they needed to talk. And that is when she told him that she was pregnant. Now, although Aaron loved her, and although Kelly wanted to keep the baby, he said that they had nothing to offer a child and that they were too young and that they needed to get an abortion. He said he was shocked because he was under the impression that she was on the pill. And even though Kelly did not want to get an abortion, Aaron dropped her off at the ferry and waited for her to return. And when she did return, apparently she didn't speak. She just held on to him and cried. Aaron describes this experience as completely shattering her, but her parents had no idea that this had just happened. And her mother was quite rude to the interviewer. She got quite sassy. She got quite cold. She just stood her ground that she had absolutely no idea that her daughter had had an abortion at 17. Mrs. Lane got so sassy with the interviewer that when the interviewer asked her, did this abortion possibly shape the way that Kelly dealt with pregnancies in the future? And Mrs. Lane responded with, obviously. It would be a year later when Kelly and Aaron were in the process of breaking up that Kelly would have yet another abortion, except this time she kept it completely to herself. Aaron would later say that he completely understands why she did that. Um, obviously, they were in the middle of breaking up. But this time it was at 20 weeks and it was a late term abortion that required two stages. Kelly says that she was extremely sick after and she didn't get any counseling. And instead of trying to ask for help, she just tried to move on with things and put it out of her mind. At this 
time she was getting started with her water polo career, which is an extremely violent sport where you often get kicked in the belly, scratched, pulled underwater. It is very competitive and a very physical sport. The water polo team that Kelly was on was prestigious and the girls on the team were known to be the popular girls. They had their own little world and the girls on this team often ended up dating football players. So Kelly had had two abortions at this point and she was really getting into her water polo career. The water polo girls in later interviews to figure out what happened and we'll get into what happened later but the water polo girls were this huge tight-knit posse and in later interviews they just all refused to comment on what had happened with her even the coaches of the water polo team described this particular team as being girls who played rough and played dirty but they were all extremely close and their coach said that this particular team of girls took delight in scaring the other teams. She would later enroll at university before dropping out to pursue her education in physical education. Her love for water polo would continue into her university years and she would coach a water polo team while studying. She graduated as a teacher with honors and this is what she wanted to do. She wanted to be a sport teacher. She wanted to teach, never mind the later rumors that her goals were to become an Olympic medalist. We'll get into those rumors later, but no, what she really wanted to do was to become a teacher. She was 19 years old when she would have her first full term pregnancy and she was still playing water polo while she was pregnant even when she was nine months pregnant so one of her coaches actually said i think kelly's pregnant and even though kelly's parents claimed that they had no idea that kelly was fully pregnant at this time in her life the coach of the water polo team said that it was actually a huge rumor as in everyone was talking like is kelly pregnant and her coach even said that she noticed it when she saw Kelly standing up on her side profile when she removed the towel that she usually held at her stomach. She said that Kelly would usually go to the edge of the pool, sit down, then remove the towel and slide into the water so that nobody could see. But at this particular day, she said that Kelly stood up and took off the towel and because she was on a side profile, she said it looked like Kelly was six months pregnant and so she went to the main coach and reported it. But the main coach said that he'd already had concerns about Kelly being pregnant and he had already brought up those concerns with her and she denied it. But although it was obvious as heck that this 19 year old girl was six months pregnant playing a violent sport, Nobody stopped it and nobody offered her help. Nobody spoke to her. The lady who reported Kelly being pregnant actually said there is no way that her mother doesn't know because Kelly Lane's mother was the team manager for the water polo team for New South Wales. And there were so many people talking and it was literally a team rumor. And when pressed on this, Mrs. Lane said, well, it's not like I'm sitting there looking at my daughter showering naked. How am I supposed to know? And when she was interviewed, the interviewer said, well, you were there when she was wearing a bathing suit. It's obvious that your daughter's pregnant but you still let her play. So Kelly carried the baby for the whole nine months, full term, and she ended up playing nine months pregnant at the grand final. On a surface level, this seems incredibly reckless of this young girl to be playing water polo when she's nine months pregnant. However, when she was later interviewed about this incident, she says that she was extremely tired and extremely sick but she didn't know how to ask for help. After losing the grand final, the entire team went to the pub and they were having drinks. But remember, this is an extremely close-knit team of like blonde girls who are just like, like that. They realized that Kelly was gone around 9 p.m. What actually had happened after the grand final was that Kelly went into labor. She had actually gone into labor at the pub 
and then took herself to a hospital. Kelly gave birth to a perfectly healthy baby and when the posse found out that Kelly was nowhere to be seen and they had already had their inklings that she was fully pregnant at the grand final, they started calling around hospitals. They started asking if Kelly Lane had given birth and they finally came to a hospital which confirmed it. This definitely speaks to how close that polo team was, um, but it also speaks to the fact that people knew and no one helped her. I can't imagine being pregnant, first of all. I'm 26. I still think I'm way too young to be pregnant, but I can't imagine doing it alone, and I can't imagine trying to juggle uh, a normal life without tipping anyone off, and I just can't imagine giving birth on my own. I just can't imagine any of that, and I can't imagine knowing that people can tell but no one offering me help or asking if I'm okay. Like, I just can't imagine that. On top of that, the really, really sad part about this particular incident is that day was her birthday and nobody checked on her, nobody tried to find her. I mean, obviously her friends called around to confirm that she was pregnant but not to offer her help merely to confirm, oh my god, she's pregnant, she's just given birth to a baby. Her parents didn't even try and find her. It's her birthday. And when Mrs. Lane was asked, do you remember Kelly Lane's 20th birthday? Her actual response was, no. Nah. Literally like that. About a day and a half after Kelly Lane had given birth, she got a day pass from the hospital to attend a celebration. And literally after she attended, she came back to the hospital. Kelly Lane would later state that when she went back to the hospital, they had a little cake for her. And she says that she remembers lying there thinking, I have nothing to be happy about. This next part is really important, um, and I also want you to remember that this is a 19-year-old girl who's just given birth in secret with parents like her mother, who is trying to keep her life together. She lied on the paperwork. She lied about where she lived and her circumstances. This is going to come in later. I think that if you were in the same situation, trying to keep this a secret, and not ruin your life, you would lie on the paperwork too. I know that I would, so. And she did actually state that she was incredibly frightened as any teenager would be. So Kelly had planned to adopt out this baby, which she did. And on all of the adoption paperwork, it said that Kelly met the adoptive parents. She also uh, had several visits with her baby, but also on the paperwork. And this will uh, give us a huge insight to what her mental state was like. On the paperwork, it said that visiting her baby was mentally traumatizing. Later comments from the coach who originally reported that she thought that Kelly was pregnant. She said that if someone had stepped in or at least offered help, she thinks that what's happened now might not have happened. She said there are a lot of adults who have a lot to answer for. Remember when I said that this popular group of water polo girls with their bleach blonde hair and their tan skin, just this perfect kind of like Gold Coast Girls, but they're like the Sydney version. I don't even know what comes first, but that's just what I think about in my head because I'm in Brisbane. I grew up on the Gold Coast and that's just like what popular girls are. So remember when I said that this posse usually ended up dating football players? That is who Kelly Lane ended up dating. She ended up dating Duncan Gillies. And when she was dating Duncan, he said that he had no idea that she was pregnant. Everyone claims that they had no idea that Kelly Lane was pregnant all these times. And when Mrs. Lane was shown photos of when Kelly Lane was pregnant, she says things like, how would I have been able to tell? She looks so thin here. Just comparing these photos of when she was four months pregnant at a party, she doesn't look like how she looks in other photos. She doesn't look thin here. I genuinely think that her mother is just in denial. And I think a lot of people think that, but I just wanted to point that out. Kelly said that she didn't plan to get pregnant again. She said that she fell pregnant again because she thought she was protected by the pill and she wasn't 
assertive enough to tell her partners to use protection. She said that after the adoption, she, you know, was hurt and she was trying to deal with it. She was acting quite recklessly and she was trying to cope with the situation and that meant that she was drinking a lot. Kelly said that she was so used to compartmentalizing her life because she had such strict parents and she was used to putting her own needs and emotions to the side to, you know, give people what they wanted. And the fact that she was, you know, coached and trained for so long under obviously with her sport, she was almost brainwashed into taking direction and hiding her needs. So Kelly Lane, after giving her baby up for adoption, falls pregnant again. One of the girls on her team actually came forward and said that she noticed that Kelly would usually just dive into the pool, but when she suspected that Kelly was pregnant again, she said that she saw Kelly go to the edge of the pool and slip into the pool rather than just diving in. She said that to confirm her suspicions, she looked at Kelly's belly under the water and she could tell that Kelly was heavily pregnant. This team member, knowing what I know, and maybe you don't know yet because we haven't spoken about it, but... She said that knowing what she knows now, she wished that she could go back and do things differently by asking her friend if she was okay. And then when interviewed about this particular pregnancy, Kelly said that she knows that people saw her hurting and she knows that people definitely noticed that she was acting differently, but nobody spoke to her and nobody asked if she was okay and she noticed that. And she said that that really affected how much she thought that she could share with people. It definitely affected the fact that she didn't feel like she could ask for help. So this is the pregnancy of Tegan Lane. And at the time, every single adult, all the coaches, all the managers, her parents, everyone denies knowing that she was pregnant with Tegan at the time. So Kelly Lane was 21 years old when she gave birth to Tegan Lane. And about a day and a half after she gave birth in hospital to Tegan, she would leave the hospital with Tegan, but show up at her parents' house an hour later without Tegan. She then showed up to a wedding wearing all white and was described as being quite carefree, as being happy and um, in hindsight, that seems quite strange. She never mentioned that she was pregnant. She never mentioned that she just gave birth and nobody has seen Tegan since. She attended the wedding dressed in white, which is noted as being particularly strange because when you give birth, you know that you are taking a risk by wearing white. But either way, she showed up with her boyfriend, Duncan Gillies, hand in hand. I know that investigators have said that Kelly Lane looks carefree here. In my opinion, I don't think she looks carefree. I believe she looks quite stressed, but this is what she looked like literally after she took her baby somewhere. Three years later, Kelly would fall pregnant again. And she tried to seek out a late term abortion, but it was too late and the doctors wouldn't do it. The baby was too developed and so she decided to take the baby to full term and then adopt the baby out again. On the forms she claimed that Duncan was the father and she also claimed that this was her first child although we know that it's not her first child. Nobody knew she was pregnant again. This is another pregnancy that she took to full term, the full nine months and when asked about if he knew that his girlfriend was pregnant Duncan Gilly said that they would only see each other a couple of times a week and that when they had intercourse, she would insist on having intercourse in the spooning position rather than face to face. Still, I don't think that you can get away with being nine months pregnant, even if you aren't being face to face. I think that he definitely knew he was just in denial and didn't ask questions and she didn't say anything. I think that it might have been quite a superficial relationship between the two. Again, she was living with her parents throughout all of these pregnancies, even the full-term pregnancies, and they say that they had no idea. Her father is a little bit of more of a likable character. He says that he feels goofy, that he didn't know, and straight after that, her mother is just... I honestly can't with her mother, but straight after he says that, 
Her mother says, well, I don't feel goofy. She was like, how am I supposed to know? The fashion was different back then. She wasn't wearing tight fit clothes. But obviously in hindsight, we do know that she was because she was wearing swimsuits. I just think that her mother is just a piece of work. But this baby is actually something that caused the caused the, the wool to be unraveled because even though Kelly did the right thing in trying to adopt out this baby that she didn't think that she could parent, she lied on the forms. And this is something that tipped off a lot of people. Now, because she used the same adoption agency as she had used with the last baby that she adopted out, not Tegan Lane, but the baby before that. And because she said on this latest baby's adoption form that this is my first baby, um, I have a boyfriend, it's, you know, this is the, the first baby that I have adopted out. The adoption agency, I guess, had red flags about that. And another thing is that because she lied about her contact details, the time lapsed on the adoption where they needed to contact her, but because they couldn't, they couldn't actually finalize the adoption process, which meant that that baby ended up being sent to the Department of Child Safety. So because this was now being investigated by a CSO, whose name is John, I'm not a fan of this particular CSO, not just because I'm a foster child and I hated them, they never seemed to care. Um, I actually don't like John because of the way he, mm, okay, we're going to talk about that later, but John was a CSO and he was in charge of investigating where this baby's mother has gone because everything on the forms for the adoption agency was fake. And so he's in charge of finding out where this mother is so that they can figure out where they're going to place this child that she tried to adopt out. So his first steps were to actually call the hospital where the child was birthed and to try and see if maybe the right contact details were on the forms. Coincidentally, the person he was talking to was like, um, are you talking about this baby? And he was like, no, I'm talking about this baby. And she was like, well, the same mother gave birth to a Tegan Lane a few years ago. And this is where he was tipped off to the notion that there is a baby that is unaccounted for. And because he had investigated, he already knew that she had given birth to a separate baby, the one before Tegan Lane, who she did adopt out. He was aware of that baby and he was aware of the baby she was trying to adopt out now. He wasn't aware of the baby in between, Tegan Lane. So now there is a baby that no one can account for their whereabouts. So he eventually got a hold of Kelly Lane by calling one of her old coaches. And on the phone call, he basically was after her. He already made up his mind. He already assumed that there was foul play with this missing baby and he tried to interrogate her over the phone. The way that he describes this phone call was quite um, distasteful in my opinion. He was like, when I called her, I knew that I got her. It was very distasteful. And then when Kelly, after the fact, after all of this happened, was interviewed and she was asked like, how did you feel with this guy like interrogating you over the phone about this baby? And she said, I felt very attacked and I felt that everything was coming to the surface. And so I just said, no, I, I, I don't know that baby. Like that's not, I didn't give birth to that baby. And so she's still trying to keep that part of her life down while she's trying to navigate what it's like being a young person who isn't getting much help and is obviously still dealing with the trauma of everything that we know of her life so far, as well as having a mother like that. I know I keep going on about that, but her mother is, I just, you're gonna end up with some problems with a mother like that, sorry. So she denies it. She says that at this point she was so frightened of this man and then John, the man who called her, was acting like, I got her, I've uncovered the truth, like I'm gonna get her. And he was very into the chase of chasing this young woman about this baby. And when he was interviewed about this phone call, even then his 
attitude towards it was that he, like, he seemed to be reveling in the chase of this teenager. And he even describes Kelly as being evil and narcissistic and a liar and someone to be, you know, uh, yeah, it was just very distasteful. So what does Kelly say happened to the baby? Because on the discharge papers, it says that around 2 p.m., Kelly left with a baby. She was discharged with her baby, Tegan Lane. The drive from the hospital to her parents' house took around an hour and she ended up at her parents' house at around three o'clock. So there would have only been minutes for her to have supposedly murdered her baby or for foul play to have happened. This is how she explains what happened to Tegan Lane. She says that she was having an affair with the baby's father. So you've got Mel, the father's partner, and you've got Andrew Norris, or Morris, who is the baby daddy. So the agreement was that she would hand over her baby to the father and his partner, and that they would raise it as their own, and that she would be able to live her life and nobody would ever know. She said that Andrew came to pick them up and they went down the elevator into the foyer and she said they were there for about 10 to 15 minutes and they were met by Mel and Andrew's mother. She said that even though she didn't feel right about handing over her baby to the baby's father because it was undocumented, that she also didn't know what other options she had. Also considering that the father's mother was there and that the partner was there and the arrangement seemed to be, I guess it works out that your baby's still gonna be looked after by the natural father. It's just gonna have a mother that isn't you, but you still get to live your life and not have anyone found out that you had a secret baby. I guess it makes sense because if there is an adult there, which Andrew's mother being there equates to an adult, and there's a couple willing to take your baby, I mean, it makes sense to me. It's not ideal. Um, the fact that it's an undocumented adoption, I mean, technically it's not an adoption because he is a natural father, but still, the fact that it's undocumented does worry me, but that's just the decision that she says that she chose to take. So they were in the foyer for about 10 to 15 minutes. They get in the car and Andrew drives her to her parents' house and then leaves with the baby. She said that she would never hurt her baby. She said that it was an agreement that they had made before she gave birth. And she said if Andrew never showed up to take his baby, that she would have just adopted out her baby like she did with her previous baby and the baby that she had after that. So she definitely knew she had options and she said, I would never have killed my baby. Why would I have gone to those lengths to keep it a secret when I could have just given it to an adoption agency like I've done so many times in the past. But this CSO investigator was relentless and he genuinely believed that there was foul play involved. So he referred the case to the Manly Police. But when it was referred to the police, it was actually referred to a detective called Detective Keo, who was friends with Kelly's father. This made John, the CSO, um, extremely upset. He said that Detective Keo should have been taken off the case just from purely knowing Kelly Lane's father. But Detective Keo says that knowing Kelly Lane's father had absolutely no impact on how he investigated the Kelly Lane case. But at the time, Kelly Lane actually was due to go on a holiday in Venice with a friend, and so there was nothing to investigate. He said that he would let John know what happened with the case when she came back, and that he would investigate it to the full extent, but Detective Keo never contacted John again. In fact, the investigation into the Kelly Lane case and the missing baby was pretty surface level. And it wasn't because of the relationship between Kelly Lane's father and the detective on her case, but actually because there was a corruption case into the Manly Police Department 
at the time. Detective Keogh was not directly involved in any corruption, but there was the investigation which actually shut down the Manly Police Office for some time. And there were actually six detectives that were arrested for corruption and drug trafficking among other charges. But this ended up having this huge probe of the entire building. When Detective Keo came in after this probe, he saw that there were computers disconnected, there were case files strewn across the entire office, and everything was a huge mess. And he noted that there were actually files missing out of some of his cases. And he cannot say with 100% certainty that the Kelly Lane case wasn't tampered with because there were so many cases that had missing files and missing videos. So he does admit that there was a surface level investigation done onto the Kelly Lane case, but he says that it more has to do with the timing of it coinciding with the corruption investigation rather than it being a, you know, relationship between Kelly Lane's father. We're now at August of 2000 when Kelly Lane is 25 years old and she falls pregnant for the sixth time. But this time she announces her pregnancy. She's 25 years old, she is in a different mindset and she wants to keep this baby. So she announces it to her friends and family. And even though she believes that she is old enough to have a baby and that, you know, obviously she's not married, like her parents would like her to be, she still announces it. She still, you know, she doesn't keep this baby a secret. And although she is 25 years old, her dad still said that she was too young to have a baby. So her father at the start was extremely shocked. Um, obviously later on down the track, he became more accepting of the fact that his 25 year old daughter is having a baby, but Kelly Lane never told them about the previous pregnancies. And she said that this was a huge burden for her to act like it was her first pregnancy. However, she did do everything that she possibly could in terms of seeing obstetricians. She rocked up on time. She did everything that she was supposed to do in her regimen. And she was a healthy, soon to be mother with a fiance who loved her and her life seemed like it was on track. In fact, this pregnancy was the only pregnancy that she ever saw a doctor. The previous pregnancies, the ones that she took to full term, she didn't see one single doctor on one single occasion. I don't know how you can be nine months pregnant, go through the whole entire nine months of pregnancy as a teenager, not knowing what to eat, not knowing what to do at certain times. Back then, I don't think that they would have been able to just like Google every single thing. She was doing this all alone and she didn't see a doctor. So I have no idea how she did that. But with this pregnancy, she saw a doctor. She saw her doctor quite often and he said that she was on time and she showed up to every single appointment that he asked her to come to. So she was very on the ball as an adult because 25 you are an adult and in this day and age a lot of people are 25 and are con that, that's considered a normal age of having a baby i don't have a baby i don't even have a boyfriend i'm living in a share house my life is not on track but i know people whose lives are on track they own houses and they have babies and they are 25. it's normal but apparently her dad was not about it apparently 25 is still too young to have a baby according to her father. Additionally, because this case has received so much attention, the obstetrician who looked after her with her known baby said that he had no idea about the previous pregnancies, but he did note that her being pregnant as a 17, 18 year old young mother, and the fact that she didn't see a doctor through any of her full term pregnancies, he says that that's a completely different Kelly Lane to the 25 year old Kelly Lane who is going to her doctor. He said that th those two Kelly Lanes are very different psychologically, mentally, development. It's just they're completely two different people because you've got a, a girl and you've got a woman. But all the while this was happening, about a year after Tegan Lane was reported as a missing person, Kelly Lane was brought into the police section again to have 
an actual interview. Detective Keo asked her to describe what happened the day that she handed over Tegan Lane. Now with this interview, the ABC network who did the Exposed documentary, the journalist was like, why, why is she there without a lawyer? And when Kelly was asked about this, she said that I, I didn't know that this was a serious interview i thought it was just a custody thing and the way that they described it was just so casual and so i just thought i was coming in for a, a casual custody questioning she said that she didn't and couldn't understand the seriousness of the situation so in 2001 kelly gives birth to this baby and she said that this was a very different experience for her obviously because she was keeping this baby and she said that she was so happy and it was the best time of her life. She said that this is my baby. This one is mine. Like I get to keep this one. And she said that her goal in life was just to make her daughter happy. But 17 months later, a new detective would come onto the case. And this new detective called Kelly in again to have a, another interview. Now, in this interview, there had been a, you know, it had been some time between the original interview with Detective Keo and this interview with this new detective, and she had some discrepancies in her story. Specifically, and notoriously, Andrew Morris became Andrew Norris. So in the first interview with Detective Keo, she had said Andrew Morris with an M, and then in this next interview, she had said Andrew Norris with an N. At this point, the detective points out that there's a discrepancy and he says, which one is it? Is it Andrew Morris or Andrew Norris? And he said, if there's anything that you need to say, you need to say it now. And she was silent for a really long time. And actually, this is what it looked like and sounded like. You've been told this lies for whatever reason. If you know where the child is and what happened to the child, it's your opportunity to tell us now. Did you kill the child? No, I did not. I did not do anything like that. Someone else. No! No! Alright, Kelly, like I said, I'm going to have to make a lot of inquiries here. I'm going to have to go Please go don't. It's going to go through the coroner's court. There will be a coroner's court here. That's why I say to you now, if there's something you're not telling us, now is the time to tell us. I don't understand how... Can, you, can we set the tape? Can I speak without the tape on? I'd rather you do it on the tape. Okay, I don't understand how you're going to go and speak with my parents or people like that who have no idea what you're going to be talking about. It's between me and Andrew. He said it would be a great deal.
As soon as the detective says or mentions or asserts that foul play was involved with her daughter's disappearance, she, without hesitation, says absolutely not, and she's offended by that assertion. And another thing to note, which I think feeds directly into what we already know that she's extremely scared of her family finding out, as soon as the detective says that they're going to question her family, she freaks out. She's like, please don't. Like, she looks terrified um, that her family might find out that she has had so many pregnancies and abortions. I really do think that this shows how much she's scared of her mother in particular. And I can see that she, you know, she, she had the relationship with her father where she was daddy's girl, where she never wanted to upset her father. And everyone who was interviewed in relation to her parents all said that her parents were prestigious and very well known in the community. And it was, kind of known that Kelly didn't want to bring shame to particularly her father and she obviously didn't want to upset her mother because her mother's. She said that she met Andrew Norris because she confirmed it was Norris with an N. So she said that she met Andrew Norris at a pub and that they went outside, they had a kiss. She remembers there being a bottle shop behind her. And she said that the walk from the pub to his house was about two minutes, less than two minutes. When police asked her to show them where this block of units is so that they can locate the father, she took them to a block of units and she said that it was on the first floor and she points out unit 10. Police said that they were able to prove that nobody with the name Andrew Norris ever lived in that unit. But interestingly, the rental records don't even go that far back. So their investigation was not very thorough. Kelly says that this happened on the tail end of October or the beginning of September. In fact, there was a possibility that Unit 10 was being subleased at the time and that the person living there might not have even been on the lease. There were also witnesses who claimed seeing mail addressed to an Andrew Norris being sent to the unit block at that period of time. And there was one man that the police could not get a hold of and subsequently did not bother to interview. But the exposed documentary actually got a hold of him. And in the documentary, the journalist Facebooks him, asks if they can, you know, FaceTime. And then she holds up a picture of Kelly Lane and says, have you ever seen this woman before? And he says, yes. She used to come around the apartment block a lot. I think she used to live there. He says he remembers her as the sandy hair girl. Because this journalist found out this piece of information, she actually flew to New Zealand because that's where he had moved to and that's where he was living. And she interviewed him. And she also brought other pictures just to make, make certain that this is the same girl that he saw. And in fact, he remembers her quite vividly. He says that he used to stay up pretty late and tinker with his car. He liked to work on his car, um, which was in the car park. He said that he would see her walking out of the apartment block in early hours of the morning and that police never tried to contact him. He said that he was under the impression that Kelly Lane actually lived there because she was there so often. He also said that he thought she was brave by walking around the street at such early hours of the morning because usually girls would be scared to do that. And when asked why none of the other tenants noticed her, he said, well, none of the other tenants were up at the time that she was visiting the apartment. He said, I was up at a very strange hour and she would come and go at strange hours. And I don't think any of the people in the apartment block would be awake at the time that I was fixing up my car. But police never interviewed him. They never got a hold of him and so they never knew this information. So in 2004, when Kelly was due to be married to her then fiancé, the police brought her in again and told her that they were going to put her case in front of a coroner and that there would be an inquest. At this point in her life, she was an adult woman and something that had happened in her 
past is coming up and I guess is threatening her now livelihood. She breaks down, she's crying, she says that her mother and father are not going to want to be around her and obviously this is a huge issue for her is that her parents are going to find out. Even though she's a 25 year old woman, um, she is extremely worried that of what her parents are going to think of her. At this point, the police try and trick her under the guise of being concerned for her mental health. They ask her if she would like some mental health services, to which she obviously takes them up on that offer because she has nobody else to talk to and this thing is still a secret. She doesn't want anybody to know, but she obviously is seeking help. We get this information from a psychiatrist who saw her at the time and she says that she was actually referred the Kelly Lane case by a local hospital where the detectives asked the hospital to see Kelly, make her spill her guts and then they would subpoena the mental health file so that they could see everything that she said. The psychiatrist said that the hospital warned her not to take the case, it would be too much drama and she would then be involved. But she said she took the Kelly Lane case because she could see a young woman seeking help and needing help and not getting help. The psychiatrist who saw her said that she believes that Kelly Lane had an extremely strict childhood and she was incredibly worried about bringing shame to her father and the repercussions that would come from her mother. Although she did make some bad decisions in her past, this particular psychiatrist said that she does not believe that Kelly Lane murdered Tegan Lane. This psychiatrist said that she could tell that her family were the main reason for her anxieties and she suggested that she tell her family what was going on with the police before the police told her family and that she did. Kelly then married her fiance three weeks later and then after that the police referred her case to the coroner and it became an inquest. The purpose of this inquest was to find out or determine whether or not they think Tegan Lane is deceased or alive somewhere. In fact, Kelly Lane was offered immunity if she just told them what happened to Tegan Lane. This immunity covered every single crime apart from murder. So if she sold the baby, if it was an illegal adoption, there would be no consequence. It would be a get out of jail free card. But Kelly Lane declined. She refused to take this immunity deal. This inquest was actually a, the, the media was not allowed to comment on it. It was still a secret. She was able to do these things in private um, and she was actually threatened. So if she didn't give up information, they said that they would use the media against her to find out what really happened. Um, because she denied their immunity deal, that's exactly what they did. And she was pretty well harassed by the media. And that is when this, that is when the entirety of Australia started calling her a baby murderer. When asked why she didn't just take this immunity deal, she said that she is not going to admit to something that she didn't do. She said that she had no reason to sell her baby, to, you know, do an illegal adoption, to murder her baby. She said that if she really was in trouble, she would have just adopted out her baby like she did the baby before Tegan Lane and the baby after Tegan Lane. But she said she thought she was doing the right thing by giving the baby to her natural father. She said she had no reason to hurt her baby and she thought she was doing the right thing for everyone involved. There was an investigation and police said that they actually looked at phone records to see if this Andrew Norris person existed, at least existing in terms of phone to phone communication. But the thing is, Kelly Lane only got a phone in December, which was after the baby was born. However, in a police interview, Kelly states that she actually kept in contact with Andrew Norris and his partner Mel through phone until 97. When the police were questioned in the exposed documentary as to whether or not they looked into phone records in 97 to see if there was a phone number matching Andrew Norris, they didn't. And it was kind of embarrassing for them, especially when you consider what 
has happened since then. So the police did not acquire any phone records from 97 and since then all of the phone records have actually been destroyed. So any chance of proving that Kelly was still in contact with Andrew Norris in regard to the baby that she gave him, he is the natural father, any chance of seeing that number in, in seeing if you can contact him through that number or getting an address from that number is gone because they did not obtain those records when they should have because now they're destroyed. And she did say, I kept in contact with him until 97. Um, they didn't look at the right records and now they're destroyed. So what about security footage in the hospital? There is none. <laughs> There's no footage from the hospital of the foyer meeting between Kelly Lane and the father of the child, as well as his partner and his mother. There's no footage. The only piece of evidence that we have from this meeting is the discharge papers from the nurse at the time. Here's something interesting. The nurse wrote on the discharge papers that they discharged Kelly Lane at 2 p.m. In fact, every interview that the nurse has had with police she has said, I have no recollection of this patient. I just recognize that that is my handwriting on the discharge papers. So whatever I've written there is whatever happened. Until the trial comes around and the media is aware of all of this Kelly Lane stuff, suddenly the nurse is recalling all of these details, even to the point where she's recalling what position Kelly's feet were in when she walked into the room. The discharge papers say 2 p.m. and she left with her baby. We know for a fact that Kelly Lane made it to her parents' house. It's an hour drive. She made it to her parents' house an hour later. There is minutes or seconds where she would have had an opportunity to kill her baby. It is not impossible. It's just close to impossible. It is more likely with that time period that she did give the baby to someone else and then go to a parent's house. That's what the timeline says. However, in the trial, the nurse is claiming that she meant 12 p.m., not 2 p.m. But the main doctor at the hospital on that day actually wrote in his discharge papers as well, 2 p.m. And when interviewed, he said that he checked the baby before they discharged Kelly Lane and Tegan Lane and said that the baby had a full clean bill of health and that she would have actually left within the hour after 2 p.m. So this nurse's strange recollection of these memories that actually the time was 12 p.m. and now I'm testifying for the prosecution is just very strange. So because the inquest with the coroner ended up in them determining that Tegan Lane is likely deceased. This brought on a whole ginormous investigation where they brought sniffer dogs to Duncan Gilly's old house because that's where they believed that she had dumped the baby. And they brought sniffer dogs underneath the house. They checked in the walls. They checked in the roof. They checked in the backyard. Literally nothing was found. And they even phone tapped her house for two years. They even got DNA samples from discarded cups and other various means of collecting her DNA. So it's a full on murder investigation now that Tegan has been declared as deceased and they're, they're getting her DNA. They're also finding and tracking down her previously adopted babies and collecting their DNA, which also proved the paternity for the fathers of those babies. Now, the identity of the fathers is uh, suppressed. Nobody knows who they are, but apparently when they were told, they were shattered to find out that they had a baby out there that they had no idea about. But basically they were building a DNA bank to compare against if they ever did find Tegan's remains. So the murder investigation went for about two years and they didn't have anything against Kelly Lane. And the main investigator being interviewed now says that we had nothing. She said that it was merely her belief that Kelly Lane had murdered her baby and that they did not meet the standard of murder charges. It did not go past a reasonable doubt. But even though there was no body and no evidence, 
they still took it to court and they still charged her with murder. Mark Tedeschi was the prosecutor for the Kelly Lane case and he is known for being ruthless and he also has a couple of complaints against his conduct. So Tedeschi had to prove that first of all the baby is dead and second of all that the baby was murdered by Kelly Lane and then third of all that the baby was purposefully murdered by Kelly Lane. But there was no evidence of death, there was no body, there was no witnesses, there was no admission of guilt. Kelly Lane had not slipped up in any way, shape or form in that time and there was really no evidence. It was just a feeling that they had. So because they didn't have any evidence, they actually attached to the murder charge three counts of perjury. Now remember when I said that lying on the adoption paperwork uh, would be something that you need to think about later. Well, this is what the perjury is for. She was charged with three counts of perjury and it was attached to the murder charge so that they could open up doors that they wouldn't be able to open up without perjury charges. And the entire point of including perjury charges regarding the adoption paperwork was to set this scene and make Kelly Lane look like a compulsive liar. So it doesn't matter that she lied because she was frightened. It doesn't matter that she lied about her address because she, you know, was a teenager who was pregnant. Um, none of that matters. It's still perjury and it still set the idea in the jury's mind that she was a compulsive liar, not that she was this terrified teenager who was trying to adopt her baby out. Um, and yeah. In fact, the judge presiding on the case asked them why they were attaching perjury charges to a murder charge when it has absolutely nothing to do with the murder charge. And he even asked them if they would like him to strike those perjury charges from the indictment, but they said no. Additionally, Kelly's defense barrister was only appointed to her case three weeks before trial. And we bring up the main investigator, even though she is a part of putting Kelly Lane in jail. We bring her up because she has said that the investigation was not complete. She says that the investigation was still going while it was on trial and she doesn't think that Kelly Lane got due process. Even the judge presiding on the case got quite annoyed because the investigation was happening on the fly and he said that the investigation usually needs to be complete before it goes to trial but he acknowledges that he knew the investigation wasn't complete but it was still going to trial. Another issue with this case is that when you are prosecuting someone, you're not allowed to tell the jury what you believe happened. You have to base your prosecution on only evidence. But that's not what Mark Tedeschi did. In fact, he threw in a completely random theory that he had actually gotten from, remember John, the CSO who was set out to get her, to bring her down. He got this theory from John, the CSO. And the theory was that she had buried her daughter in an Olympic field. This is really interesting because the prosecution based their entire case on the fact that they believe she killed her child because she wanted to represent Australia in the Olympics for water polo. However, every single one of her friends and family say that they've never heard her express feelings or wants to represent Australia in the Olympics. This is merely something that the media picked up from the prosecution saying that this is why she murdered her baby. She had no interest in competing in the Olympics and even her friend said that if she actually wanted to compete in the Olympics, she wouldn't have been at the bar every Saturday with the water polo club. She said that it was just a posse and it was a, it was a group that she fit into and she loved sport and she wanted to teach. She didn't want to be this Olympic star and she never even spoke about that. It's simply something that the media picked up and the prosecution used as a theory. In fact, the Crown told them to strike the record because it's not based on evidence and Mark Tedeschi should not have said that. 
But he said that. And because he said that, the jury had it in their mind. You can't just strike something from the record and suddenly the jury forgets that you've put that in their mind. So the judge asked the prosecution, would you like me to get you a new jury? Because just because you strike it from the record doesn't mean that it's off their mind. Like, would you like a new jury? And the defense said no. So that really hurt the case on top of the fact that this nurse, for decades, the nurse was like, I don't remember this particular patient. That's my handwriting. It's in amongst the thousands of babies that I have observed being birthed. But apparently for the trial, she remembered everything. So that also hurts the case as well. The judge began to grow very concerned for the defense because the investigation was still happening while trial was going on. He said that they were being buried in paperwork and if the prosecution continued, he would just completely throw out the trial. On top of that, the prosecution presented upwards of 75 witnesses, whereas the defense offered zero witnesses. Kelly also offered the police a description of Andrew Norris. She said that he was five foot ten, he was a Caucasian male, he had tan skin, and he had this mousy blonde hair. But the police never put together a profile. The documentary Exposed actually paid for one of the top composite sketch artists in Australia to actually meet with Kelly and put together a profile, an opportunity that the police never gave her in the investigation. This composite sketch artist said that he would usually know if someone is just making up features of a random person within the first half an hour. He was a police officer and he's been doing this for a really long time. That's probably why he's one of the best in Australia. He spent three hours with Kelly Lane doing a composite sketch and he said that she was completely consistent, completely honest, and they actually came up with a sketch and this is what it looks like. She even brought up the fact that his hair was spiky at the front and he had a little scar on his nose. And in the trial, the prosecution in their opening statements told the jury, you'll be hearing from the Andrew Norris, but they never heard from him and this is why. There was an Andrew Morris and he was contacted by the police to come in for an interview. They showed him one picture of Kelly Lane and said, do you remember this woman? And he said, I don't think so. Like, she looks recognizable, but I don't think so. He said that when he said that she kind of looks familiar, but he doesn't recognize her, that the police started feeding him information, saying that she grew up in Sydney and that she was just a groupie um, following surfers. And he remembers that at the time he was a surfer and that he had sex with a girl on a beach, but he doesn't remember her name and he doesn't remember her. So in his mind, he thinks this might be the girl that I had sex with that one time. So he goes along with it. He agrees to testify for the prosecution. His statement was supposed to be that he had had one sexual encounter with Kelly Lane, but he didn't have the child. And this was supposed to be their witness, but he never gave evidence. And the reason for this is that the prosecution wanted the defense to get rid of their one star witness who will prove to be very important later on. But the trade-off was that they wouldn't put this Andrew Morris on the stand. The lead investigator said that the reason the prosecution did this is because they wanted to neutralize the defense's one star witness. So the defense agreed took off their one witness in order for this Andrew Morris, fake Andrew Morris guy, to be taken off the witness stand for the prosecution. Kelly Lane says that she has never seen this Andrew Morris in her life and that she did not sleep with him and he even came out and said that he doesn't know Kelly Lane and that he only went along with it because he felt that it had gotten too big that he couldn't go back. So who is this witness that the prosecution traded their Andrew Morris for? This witness is actually a childhood friend of Kelly Lane who recalls a conversation that she had with Kelly around the same time that this affair with Andrew Norris was happening. Now, this conversation was when Kelly was drunk, 
but the witness was not drunk. The conversation was when she mentioned that she was having an affair with a man named Andrew. Now, when asked if she thinks that maybe she just made up this memory of this conversation to help her friend, the witness said that she remembers the name Andrew because she remembers thinking that's my brother's name. She also said that she would never help her friend if she thought her friend had hurt a baby, especially because her occupation is that she is a child protection officer for the United Nations. So this is an extremely credible witness who should have been heard by the jury, who was swapped out by a pretty shitty defense team. On the morning that Kelly was sentenced, she said that she just did her normal routine. She kissed her daughter goodbye and said she would see her in the afternoon because she didn't think that this would actually be a conviction of murder. And even the judge said that he didn't think that the prosecution's case was beyond a reasonable doubt. He said that he thought the jury would just come back with a not guilty verdict. And he said that he didn't expect that they would take eight days to deliberate and come back with 11 people saying convict her and only one person saying don't. But because the majority of the jury said that they believed she was guilty, the judge decided that he would rule on the majority rules, which meant that Kelly Lane was convicted of her daughter's murder even though there's no body, no evidence, no witnesses, and there's actually evidence that there is an Andrew Morris somewhere out there, maybe not with that name, but who was living in the apartment block at the time, because there is a witness to that. And also the timeline to have murdered her baby does not match up. And even the main investigator of the case said that she didn't think that due process was done. She didn't think that the jury would come back with a guilty verdict because the investigation was still happening. It wasn't complete and they didn't have anything beyond a reasonable doubt. The judge said that if it was up to him rather than the jury, he would have decided something different. Kelly Lane was sentenced to 18 years in prison for the murder of baby Tegan Lane. She'll be eligible for parole in 2023 and she's made a couple of appeals that have been denied. Something interesting to note is that Kelly Lane was actually assessed by a psychiatrist who specializes in assessing women who have abused their children or murdered their children. This is very interesting because when this psychiatrist was asked if her assessment found that Kelly Lane was a liar, whether Kelly Lane was a narcissistic person or whether or not Kelly Lane was evil, the psychiatrist said no to all of those. In fact, Kelly Lane revealed to the psychiatrist that at 15 she was date raped and that this definitely shaped how she viewed her body, how she viewed sexual experiences and it gave a huge insight to her thought processes in terms of her body, relationships, sex etc. The psychiatrist said that she was actually an empathetic mother, which is not characteristic of a mother who would kill her children. She said that Kelly actually breastfed her children and she was traumatized by giving her children up. It wasn't a cold-hearted decision. It was merely a decision that she made to survive in her life as she knew it. The assessment concluded that it was unlikely that Kelly Lane murdered Tegan Lane. The assessment also concluded that Tegan Lane was likely alive. The judge who presided over the Kelly Lane case says that Ever since that case, he has refused to preside over any criminal cases. And the lead investigator on the Kelly Lane case says that she was discharged from the police force because she got PTSD from this case. She says that this case broke her and she will never know if Kelly Lane actually did murder her child. It is extremely important to note though that the psychiatrist who specializes in assessing mothers who have hurt or murdered their children said that there was something off about Kelly Lane when she mentions the name Andrew Morris or Andrew Norris. She says that her body language changes and she says that the conversation around the name Andrew Morris becomes very surface level. So the exposed documentary actually pressed 
Kelly Lane on this one particular thing because this is the only thing really that can't be proved. From the investigation and from everything that's happened, we can say pretty confidently that or at least I can say pretty confidently that I believe that Tegan Lane is alive out there somewhere. But something that just doesn't ring true is the name Andrew Norris or Andrew Morris. So when the exposed journalist presses her on this, this is the first time that Kelly Lane has ever opened up about her not knowing really if this was the name of the man that she had the baby to. She does get defensive at the start, but in the end she says, yes, okay, there's a possibility that he didn't give me the right name. You can tell she's extremely upset by this. I think anybody would be upset thinking that they had a child to a man who didn't even respect them enough to give them his right name. It is extremely likely that when this man met her at the bar, he didn't think that he was going to have a baby to this woman. It's extremely likely that he gave her a fake name because it was an affair. He had a partner, Mel. So Kelly Lane is 95% sure that his first name is Andrew because she says he responded to Andrew. She's not completely sure if the full name is Andrew Morris, Andrew Norris, although up until that phone call, she was adamant that no one pressed her on the name because she was like, I know the name. The name's Andrew Morris. Don't press me on this. I know who my baby's father is. But honestly, I don't think there's any shame in her admitting that it's a possibility that he lied to her. And that's quite possibly why nobody can find him and nobody can find the baby that he took. My theory, and I'm sure you've guessed it by now, is that the foyer incident did happen. I do believe that Kelly Lane gave up her baby, Tegan Lane, to the man who she believed was her father. I just don't believe that he gave her the correct name. I genuinely believe that he lied about his name and that's why people can't find him because there are witnesses from that apartment block who do say that she was coming in and out of his house. The lighting got a little bit strange there, I'm so sorry. So I do genuinely believe that there is a child out there who doesn't even know that Kelly Lane is her mother. I think the only way that this will ever be resolved is if the man who told Kelly Lane that his name was Andrew Morris comes out and says, that was me. I'm sorry I lied about my name. I'm sorry I let it go on this long. I was just scared. And honestly, I don't think that he would ever come out, um, especially if he's let her go to jail for this, unless he lives under a rock and didn't know, or unless he actually did something to the baby. But I don't think that's likely. I genuinely think that if his own mother was there with his partner, it was an arrangement that they had already arranged prior to Kelly giving birth, I genuinely think that they would have raised the baby as their own. Um, I don't think that he would have murdered the baby, especially if he went to such great lengths to involve his own mother in it. I do think they would have raised the baby. But again, I do think that that night at the bar when they first met, he lied about his name and he just never corrected her or told her that he lied about the name and he just kept sleeping with her and kept the affair going to the point when she's handing over the baby. When I was first told about this case, um, the person kind of described it as if nobody knew that this young girl was pregnant and how many pregnancies that she had. And it seemed like this outlandish story that someone could, you know, pretend that they weren't pregnant for this whole time. But after this brilliant documentary and after doing my own research on this case, it's pretty clear that people knew but nobody wanted to help her. It's pretty clear that this is, you know, because it sounds like a crazy story when you find out someone's been pregnant six times and had, you know, a lot of them were abortions, but to be pregnant six times and say that people didn't know is just a crazy story. But going into the depths of it and finding out, well, hey, Everyone did know, no one helped her though. And all of the different babies, when you actually go into detail and try and understand the psychology behind a 19, sorry, 17 
18, then 19, then 20 year old, it's understandable. And I genuinely believe that she did the right thing in trying to adopt out her babies and, you know, I do think that was the right thing. And honestly, I understand why she lied on the paperwork. I don't think she would have known that if they didn't get a hold of her that the, um, that the adoption time would lapse and that that baby would go into the care of Department of Child Safety. She's a teenager. She is going to want to lie on paperwork. She's not going to think that she's going to be brought to a jury for charges of perjury. You know what I'm saying? I, I genuinely do not believe that Kelly Lane murdered baby Tegan Lane. I don't believe it. I understand every move that she made and I don't think that she is an evil, narcissistic liar. And I'm sorry if you don't uh, agree with me on this. I know that Australia has very rigid views on women and babies and women's roles and all that kind of stuff. And that is something that I want to end this video on because if you do decide to watch the documentary on this particular case, I think you'll come to the same conclusion as what I did, even though, even though the documentary's journalist did make out like Kelly Lane was a liar at the end of it. She did cast a lot of doubt on Kelly Lane. I don't think that that was fair. I, I just, I just don't think that casting doubt on Kelly Lane at the end was um, very fair. But if you do decide to watch this documentary, it's on Netflix. It's brilliant. It's called Exposed. I think the, the story of Kelly Lane, I'll put the thing here. But you will notice that all of the men involved in prosecuting Kelly Lane, in uh, investigating Kelly Lane, especially the CSO who brought the case to police's attention in the first place, are extremely misogynistic. They have very rigid views on where women should be, how many men women should sleep with. Um, they are very frustrating men. Apart from the judge, the judge was actually really fair and um, really, you know, not like those conventional Australian white men. But every other person, especially the prosecutor, especially the CSO, John, was just like reveling, frothing over the idea that they could punish this woman. And it's like they, they didn't even think or empathize with the fact that she wasn't even a woman. She was a teenager. She was a young girl and she had been date raped. She had had two abortions before any of this happened. And she had this mother that is just, please watch the documentary. I think that, you know, you'll, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about um, when we talk about how the mother is. I just, I think if you grow up with a mother like that, who seems quite narcissistic, who seems very self-absorbed. And let me just say, when the guilty verdict was read out, Kelly Lane, um, she collapsed. And her mother made a huge scene and she decided that she wanted to collapse right after her daughter collapsed. She, she seems like the kind of mother who wants to make everything about her. And in every single interview, she did that. She did just that. She made everything about her. And I think if you grow up with a mother like that, you are going to end up with mummy issues. And that's all I'm saying. I don't believe, do not for a second, not even a slither of a second, believe that Kelly Lane murdered baby Tegan Lane. I think that Tegan Lane is out there somewhere with a different name and she's never going to know unless maybe the father's mother who was there at the hospital comes out and either tells the daughter or tells someone. Somebody has to say something from the Norris family for this to ever be solved. What do you guys think? I'm so sorry if you don't agree with me. I know it's a really, um, uh, it, it, it's not, it, it's, it's just an opinion that I have that I don't think that she did it. Um, and I'm sorry if that goes against Australia because Australia has, you know, obviously the media said baby killer. It was headlines, you know, I'm sorry if that's not what you believe, but what do you believe? Have you read up on this case? Have you investigated this case? Tell me what you think. I wish that I could go back in time and help this girl because 
you know, I can't imagine hurting like that, but hurting in private and having to go through all of this on your own. For your parents to not even look for you on your birthday when you've just given birth. For no one to even talk to you and obviously you notice people noticing that you're hurting and that you're pregnant. I can't, I want to go back in time and ask her if she's okay. So what do you guys think? Let me know. I know this wasn't a um, typical case. It is a missing ca persons case. I do want to do more missing persons cases. I think they are incredibly interesting. And in fact, next week's case is a missing persons case. Um, let me know what you think. Do you think that Kelly Lane murdered her baby? Do you have another theory? Where do you think this man is? What did you guys think of the documentary? Anyways, you guys, thank you so much for watching. Give this video a thumbs up. It really does help. And if you like these videos, I do them every single Sunday. Subscribe. You know how to do that. I put out makeup videos, hauls, and story times on a Wednesday. But every single Sunday is a true crime Sunday. So thank you so much for watching. And I will see you in the next one.